Okay, so my name is Matej David. I'm a um, um, trained computer scientist. I'm working at OICR in computational biology. So I was saying we're um, uh, me and my uh, the PI that I'm working with, Jared Simpson, who will be speaking later today. Uh, we are developing algorithms for um, uh, uh, assembling and uh, new data and um, putting together data from different sequencing technologies like Illumina and Pacific Biosciences and Oxford Nanosphere. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, a reference alignment. Uh, so that's, that's our model. Okay, so uh, the objectives are to, in general, to understand the problem of alignment. Um, I'm going to be talking in uh, particular about Illumina sequencing data, and uh, Illumina data has certain types of errors and certain types of characteristics, so I'll be speaking about those and not so much about other sequencing technologies. Um, I'm going to learn some terminology. We'll see some uh, the common file formats that you have to deal with, and during the lab we'll just run actually some alignment. Aligner. And by the way, so when I alignment and mapping, I consider them equivalent things. So read mapping, read alignment is the same thing. I think I used the term aligner throughout the presentation, but read mapper is just the same. Thing. Uh, okay. So let's talk about Illumina sequencing first. Uh, there are all sorts of sequencing technologies out there, and they're evolving. Um, and some sequencing technologies are emphasizing uh, throughput and gigabases per run. Others are trying to maximize read length. And then there's all this picture of all these trade-offs in between them. Uh, we'll be talking about Illumina today. Uh, so I'll just give you a very brief description of how it works. Bear in mind, I'm a computer scientist, so I don't really know. Right? <laughs> so probably, probably some, some of you know better than me. So with that in mind, I, I only need to describe as much to, um, to touch upon like the source of, of errors and how those impact read mapping. Okay. So uh, starting with um, genomic DNA that is uh, fragmented into uh, little fragments, 200 to 300, or maybe up to 500, 600 base pairs. Um, those fragments are taken and uh, their uh, uh, adapters are attached to them. And then they are put on a flow cell. On the flow cell, uh, so on the flow cell, there is, right, uh, there is, um, PCR amplification going on. So individual DNA molecules, which are represented by this single uh, strand here, they are amplified into clusters, which are these guys over here, in such a way that ideally all the molecules in the same cluster are... Uh, okay, thank you. Right. So all the, all the molecules in the same cluster should be the same. Uh, they're not always the same because they're all sorts of errors, but that's the ideal thing. Okay, and uh, after that, the slides are placed into the sequencer, and the uh, uh, DNA bases are read by uh, what's called sequencing by synthesis. So um, you have a single strand of DNA hanging, and individual bases which are uh, labeled with some fluorescent molecule are added. So here we have the, uh, the base is an A, so a T comes because it, uh, it matches it and it's attached here. A light is uh, um, it's applied to the, to the entire plate and a, an emission, a light emission is produced, right? So this is what we see. And the, uh, the process continues base by base. So uh, in the second round, another base is added. It will be a G, and then another a C, and a C, and a C. And, so. and this, is, is, this goes on for all those uh, clusters and all like the entire plate at the same time. 
So this is what the sequencer sees, like these uh, uh, nice dots, colored dots. Okay. Um, base calling is the process of translating these kind of images, which are seen by the sequencer, into reads. So they, the, the machine sees this, and it produces letters, which are these guys over here. And also, it estimates the errors for every single for every single letter. It gives an estimate of the error that the base that it produced might not be the real one. Okay, and that's has to do with the colors that it sees. Okay, so uh, what I'm wanna get to is uh, types of errors that are specific to the Illumina sequence. Okay, so in here, uh, in the A slide, like we have a, an ideal scenario. We have a cluster with three molecules, and the sequencing is all in sync, and all three uh, molecules are like the, the red labeled base is being added to all of them, and then the laser shines, and all of them emit the red, and all this is very nice and clear, and produces a red uh, color, which is red by the sequence. Okay, so that's the idea of B. B is uh, a case where the different, uh, even though the molecules are the same in the cluster, the they are defaced, right? So the same, the, the letters are the same, but this process of like adding a base and shining a laser and then adding another base, shining a laser, this became defaced. So this one is now shining a, a red light, and this one here it skipped the red thing and it's shining a blue light, and this one maybe it's behind one base, so it's shining the green light. So then the sequencer looks at the slide and it sees like in the zone of this particular cluster, it sees some color, which is a mix of all these other colors. So then it will not be sure which color is the real thing, right? So it, it will produce, it will probably choose one of them, and it will, ideally, it, will, it should say that, well, I'm not so sure about this particular uh, base form. Uh, the C here is just like a loss of signal. So here there were, initially there were enough molecules, but now some of them broke off, so there's only few of them left, and maybe the signal doesn't have uh, as much intensity as the sequencer expects, so it might might not know the sequencer might be confused by that, so there might be errors. And finally, it's just for, for cost of the thing is a generic thing, like maybe the, like the, uh, the molecules which are being added are erroneous in some way, so they're shining a wrong light. Um, the idea is here that sequencing, Illumina sequencing mainly has a uh, substitution error. So it's like, even though the, uh, the, the as, as you go to the stream, usually it's certain bases will be wrong, as opposed to having insertion or deletion errors. Okay. Um, also, uh, okay, yeah. Are not uh, they? They have their own processes, and because of that, they have their own uh, error. those things are cleared, the, the fluorescent things are cleared, so that in the following phase, like a new phase gets appended there. So it, and the efficiency is part of the 
So actually, as the so the um, I think in Illumina the uh, clusters are sequenced from from the hanging up down towards. So this is the plate where they're attached, and I think the sequencing goes from like top to bottom. So they're like going in here and then the sequencing goes down. And just because of this process, you can understand that if there's more chance of the basis at the end of the read to be uh, of poor quality and have more errors than the ones at the beginning. And the reason is because of this defacing. Like towards the end of the read, it's more likely that at some point before the, the various molecules become defaced. Right? So that's why in, uh, in Lumina, so we see one of the uh, characteristics is that we have substitution errors. The other one is that the bases at the end of the reads are poor, poorer quality than the ones at the uh, beginning of the reads. Yeah. It means like uh, the rate of spacing increases for uh, lambda rate length, right? I don't know if you can hear this just a question. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. the question was whether the phasing, uh, this defacing process increases towards the end of the read. And it doesn't, I'm not sure if it doesn't have to be, like even if it's constant, at the beginning here, you only went through three phases, which would have had to be uh, done at the same time. Like by the end of the read, you have had to done like a hundred or whatever the read length is. So even if the phasing uh, uh, happens like with a constant, it's like a constant probability, it just accumulates towards the end of the read. So that's why you see worse uh, quality. There are errors during reading, and there are also errors during, uh, like during the cluster construction. Okay, but this is less the smaller problem. Um, the accumulation of the So, yeah, probably it's, you might not even see them like in your file. It's like the, if, if, if a cluster is really bad and the sequencer is really confused, what's going on in that particular molecule. It, it might be that the internal uh, quality control of the machine will just not give you that to read. You just, you just see the one that they have to set them. But yeah, that means there are errors in reading and errors in anticipation. So this, uh, this shows you, uh, just an estimate, this is the base position within an Illumina read. So it goes from zero up to like usually there are 100, these days there are a bit longer, 150. This is from, I think, two years ago, so the, new, like the newer read lengths by Illumina are a bit longer, it goes up to 250, I think. And the uh, various curves are different organisms, and I don't know which one is which. Uh, but ideally, uh, the what I'm used to, what, the way I think about genome sequencing is like one of these things at the bottom. So it's, the quality is really good at the beginning of the read, and then it starts uh, falling down to the end of okay, And that's why actually during the lab that we're going to do, we're actually going to do some read trimming based on based on this quality. So we'll come back to this. Um, 
Okay, so the summary is that Illumina has like a low error rate about 5% of the bases are erroneous, mainly substitution, and this, this uh, differs from other technologies where like the entire discussion doesn't apply to them. There are other technologies, like these are long read technologies which have much higher error rates. And they, uh, but they look, they usually their insertions and deletions. Uh, some substitutions, but not, not as many. Um, okay, so paired reads, uh, it's like another trend we're gonna be hearing about. So Illumina sequencing produces paired and reads. So what this means is that so the genomic DNA is fragmented, uh, the adapters are ligated, and then these clusters are built on the flow cell that looks like this. And for every one of those clusters, or like every one of those molecules is sequenced twice. So it's sequenced once from, this is like a primer, sequencing primer one, sequencing primer two, so once they're sequenced from one end towards this side, so from the overhanging end towards the flow cell, then this uh, cluster generation is repeated and then the molecules are sequenced from the opposite side, so then from sequence primer two <coughs> towards one. Okay, so for that reason, for every one of these DNA molecules is gonna get read twice and uh, uh, the directions will look, will look something like that within that fragment, the 300 BT or 500 BT fragment. Okay, so that's fair and uh, the alternative to that is what's called mate pair sequencing, and the reason for this is uh, that let's say when you're trying to assemble a genome, uh, if you only have information from 500 BT long fragments that might be uh, not sufficient to resolve repeats which are longer than this length. So usually when you're trying to, to assemble a genome, a novel genome, um, you want to have information which has longer range. Okay, so uh, for that reason, the, like there's, there's this other way to do uh, 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 main pair sequencing. Right? So, the genomic DNA is fragmented. Now the, the fragments are, let's say, two to five kilobases, or could be even more. Um, at the end of these fragments, there's a biotin, like they're labeled with biotin, like these ends, then they're circularized. So we have these circles which are two to five or even more KB long. Then these circles are uh, fragmented back to uh, 400 to 600 uh, basis. Okay, and then out of this whole mixture, like if you look at this circle, there the biotin label will just occur like in one point. So then, the other things which don't which don't have biotin are are uh, washed off. So that at the end, you pick these fragments which are four to five hundred six six hundred base pairs which are labeled with biotin. Okay, and then these things are fed back into this, uh, at this stage of the sequence. Okay, and then, so from here you go here and then you do the same thing. Okay, so what happens is that, because of this process, these fragments, they also get read twice, but now the two arrows of reading will be pointing towards this center biotin thing. Okay, and then if you uh, undo the process, you will get reads, you will get paired reads, which are reading these large fragments, but they are pointing outward. Okay, so they're pointing, like if these things, like you're, you're gonna get a read which points that way, and here you're gonna read, get a read which points this way. But the point is that the two reads, which come from the same fragment, will have uh, uh, the distance between them on the genome will be much larger, will be in this order. Um, so again, 
I don't know exactly how this is going to work. I just know that the machine produces <coughs> two reads, so you're going to get two reads. Uh, from a mapping point of view, like what I know is how they should be mapping on the you know. I don't know exactly what happens in the middle and how the machine probably it has some internal way to detect to skip the biopsy so that the read doesn't go through the biopsy molecule on the other side. So I'm just guessing because like during this step, like when you have these certain molecules and you fragment them, you, you can't really make sure that the biotin will be in the middle of, of the fragment that you obtain, right? So it could be wow. towards the end, so. so it might appear in sequence. Yeah, see. yeah, so, yeah. So I, I, I don't know if, uh, I think the machine will take care of that. Okay, so those those are, when we talk about the third end, Pairs, this, these are the, uh, this is what, what that terminology means. Okay, and when we go to read mapping, the read mapper, like the Reiner, will need to know what type of reads it should map to the gene. Okay, uh, I think these days, the aligners that we're going to use, they, can, they know how to auto detect this kind of stuff. So you give them like a bunch of reads being classified, and they will, they will detect this stuff. They will, uh, they will realize that those two arrows are pointing towards each other at a small distance or away from each other like this at the left. Okay, but this, this is just so that you, you know what, what this uh, is all about. Okay, so uh, fast format, this is the format in which, uh, in which uh, reads are stored in uh, files. Okay, so this is, this is what an entry for a read looks like. Have a label over here, and this is a read sequence, which are the bases. Then this is a plus, which is a, um, a comment, or it's actually a, an ID or a label for the quality, so for the sequence of quality uh, bases, which, is, which follows. And we're going to see those in the lab more closely. Um, Within a file, so this is what the file looks like. So this is a, an entry for one read, the score line. This is another read, and then another read, and so on. So they're like consecutive like this. Um, right, so the base quality scores, which, are, which is this four line, the fourth line, uh, that is uh, an integer. It's a way to represent the probability that that specific base is uh, erroneous. Okay, um, I forgot to put, I had like a formula here. Um, but anyhow, so if you were gonna see it in the lab, I guess. So given the probability of the error, that the, the base is uh, wrong, being something like this, that gets associated with an integer base quality, which looks something like this. So the, the conversion is something like minus Quality is minus 10 log base 10 of the error. So V is about minus 10 times log base 10 of the error. Okay, so this formula translates. Uh, uh, like a double precision probability of error into an integer, which is usually nice to behave between 0, 40, or 60. And then these integers are encoded in these fast two files by a scheme which is usually FRED plus 33, which means that the encoded character Q, so the, the quality Q is encoded as a character with ASCII code 33 plus Q. Okay? Uh, and then there was another scheme which was called FRED64 for older Indian data. Uh, this is a, it's like a nice scheme um, of the FASTQ Wikipedia page. Here you have the ASCII characters, like in order, what, from code 33 to, and so on, going up. And this is showing you what the uh, quality values are uh, um, for every specific character under this scheme. So 
these days, even Illumina, like the recent uh, uh, machines they produce reads with uh, where the quality are encoding that is uh, FRED plus 33, meaning that we're talking about this range over here. So from exclamation mark to capital I. In the past, if you're dealing with uh, older Illumina data, they used to have FRED plus 64, which means that the range of character you see would be something like um, so, this is just so that you know what those things are about. Uh, if you look at them, the two ranges, they have many of these uppercase letters uh, in common. The FRED plus 33 has the numbers over here, and then the FRED plus 64 has lowercase letters. So, if, if you just want to look at some data and decide quickly which one it is, so this one has numbers, right? Has characters which are numbers, so that's FRED plus 33. And again, the aligner should know about which FRED you're using, but usually, I think these days it will hopefully also detect that as well. Uh, fast to fast, like how do you store paired and uh, make pair reads? So usually they're stored in separate files, so you have a file with read 1 and a file with read 2. Uh, Usually the ends that read the names end with this slash one slash two, but that's not always the case. So, uh, and uh, sometimes you have the paired reads interleaved in the same file. So you have the two reads which are paired like consecutive, and then the next two reads, and then the next two reads, next two reads. Okay, and again the aligners, they have some option to tell them, you have to tell them how, how to read the pairs of the and they will, most of them when you do pair them and read, you just give them two, two different types of files and they'll figure it out. Um, okay, reference alignment. So the goal is uh, why do we align to the reference? So uh, usually we, we're trying to infer uh, variations in a donor genome which we're interested in, and we need to find. Uh, reads that come from certain genomic uh, regions of interest. Okay, in rare cases, reference alignment can be used to, to actually reconstruct the donor genome it's like, as, a, as a first step in like some other, kind of like a longer process. Um, the issues with alignment are that so genomes are large and repetitive. There's a lot of question about the real life. How do you know which pairs go to so the, the names, um, the names are the same, and also I think the the families are the same, and the reads should be in the same order in the two files. So it shouldn't be mixed up. Like so, it should be read one of pair one, read two of pair one, and so on. And that, so the, the issues that we have to deal with when we're doing reference alignment are all these differences. So the, the differences between the donor genome, which are uh, single nucleotide polymorphism in the so like structural variation, which are larger in the so all sorts of like uh, uh, um, inversions and so on. There are also differences between donor reads, so there are all of these variations plus you have sequencing error. So uh, uh, an aligner has to deal with all these differences to find the location where to put where a read comes from in the reference genome. Okay, uh, the main steps like in general, you know, 
and if, and if it does, if I, all of the aligners, they try to construct some kind of index for the genome at the beginning, or for the reference genome, and that you can reuse for uh, different runs. So if, if the reference will give some index, you reuse that. And then for each donor read, if they identify genomic regions where that might be aligned, and those are done in all sorts of ways, like using hash tables or whatever. Um, pairing information is, if, if it is available, is used to uh, reduce the list of candidate locations where you might place a certain read. And then a more thorough alignment is done in those regions of interest, and this step is costly, and the, the reason you don't want to do this all the time is because it will be too slow, so that's why you have all these pre steps. And then various aligners have various stopping criteria, so you have like all these candidate locations, the read get aligned, the read get aligned, get aligned there, and uh, at some point the aligner has to stop and say, okay, this is the best location, or these few locations are the best location for this region. And again, the, the aligners have uh, different features, such as they, some of them they do secondary alignment, so they report these three get mapped here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. Or just they just give you the one location, which is the best alignment, and some of them they do split alignments, and these are relevant for RNA sequences, where you were trying to map across uh, uh, splice. So I've given a read. This is just a schematic of what I was saying. This is a read here, this is the reference. The, the aligner might identify three locations, candidate locations which look like this. So this one has one mismatch, this one has two mismatches, but this one aligns properly. So in this case, uh, probably the aligner will say, this is the mapping location, this read comes from this position in the reference genome, you know, because this is the best. So uh, again, during all this process, uh, reference alignment, you have to keep in mind what we're trying to do. So we have reads from a donor genome which are mapping to a reference genome. Yeah, and um, uh, sometimes the reference will not contain all the sequence which is present in the donor. So that will uh, that might be a problem later on. Uh, how do you map paired reads? So looking the alignment looks at the pair. Let's say it looks at the first read that it finds two possible locations in the reference, and then it looks at the second read in that pair, and it finds that here it, it's kind of a really bad match, like there are too many mismatches, but here the paired read maps perfectly. So then in this case, the aligner will probably decide that this is the location where these two reads are going to be mapped. Uh, there are all sorts of properties of aligners to, con to consider. So uh, one is accuracy, like misaligned reads are a source of false positive for variables down the line, like in the processing pipeline. Sensitivity, you have to allow for all sorts of variation. For humans, you have one type of uh, um, uh, variation that you expect within two humans, like for other species, like that might be more or less. Uh, speed, you have large amounts of input data to deal with, memory also. And the question only comes like which one is the best alignment? I, I don't know. Uh, so I'm using, like, I, I'm, I have experience with the uh, ones which are uh, used as, like, all around with the liners. But there are ones, there are some which are faster, some which are more accurate. Um, if you need special functionality like aligning the cross flex functions, there are special aligners to do that. And I'll just say series and perfect because uh, I actually I had to, I found like one from two years ago and I was going to put it here, but then I clicked on the page where the table was supposed to be updated and the link didn't work anymore, so I did uh, So in, in, in our lab, we're just going to be using DWA and I also have an open print book that is going to be working. Um, Sandbam format, so I'm gonna be skipping this because we're, we're going to see this in the lab. Okay, so um, this what this is what the alignment format looks like. 
So you have reads, there are certain flags, which we'll see in the lab. Chromosome position, where this read is mapped, which is 19 in this case. Uh, position within that chromosome. This is a mapping quality. Uh, this is a string which describes how the read maps to that location. And these other things are information about where the uh, paired, where the other read in the pair is being mapped. Here, equal means that it's the same chromosome 19. This is the position where the other read maps. And this is the difference, like the, the size of the fragment of DNA being observed. This is the sequence of the read, and then these are the base qualities. The only thing I wanted to uh, mentioned here before we move on is this mapping quality field. So uh, this mapping quality is again it's a thread encoding of a probability the alignment location is wrong. So it's this same formula. So a mapping quality of 30 means that one in a thousand alignments with that quality will be wrong. Okay and what I wanted to emphasize is that mapping quality and base qualities which are these things are kind of different things. Um, so these ones, they refer to how the sequencer uh, read that particular base and whether the signal, the light signal, was uh, uh, clear or not. Right? This mapping quality has to do with all other locations where a certain read can be placed in the genome. Okay, so a read that comes from a repetitive region of the genome, which occurs a lot uh, in the genome. Um, it might have great base quality, so this could be all like 40s base qualities, like all the bases are clear, like the process went very nice, but the mapping quality would be zero because the, the, alignment, the alignment would just look at this read and it would find a hundred or a thousand positions where it might be placed in the genome. So for that reason, the, usually what the alignment does, it just picks one location, and it just puts like a mapping quality of zero, saying that, well, this read maps here, but I, this, the probability that this mapping is wrong is like really high. So that's, that's what this means. Conversely, you can have the other situation. You, have, you can have poor base qualities, but somehow the sequence is like very unique that the aligner figures out like this exact location where it comes from the genome and it says, well, it comes from there, even though there are some bases which are wrong, it still comes from there because there's nothing anywhere, there's no other location in the genome anywhere close from, from this field. So, okay. Uh, then, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about were these um, uh, sources of errors. Uh, in the mapping process. Okay, so I'll talk about three of them. One is duplicate. So if you look at, let's say you do reference alignment and then you open up some visualization tool which Mark will be talking about because uh, we don't have it in the lab. The next module will do visualization. So you look at the reads and they look like this. So these are individual reads. The colors are the directions of the reads, like uh, one, some are positive, some are negative strand. And this is a map of the coverage. So you can see the coverage is kind of constant, and then all of a sudden it has like this really big bump, and then it continues, okay? And then you look at individual reads, and this is what you see. Okay, so what happened here is that, well, there is a chance, you know, that this in, in entire process of preparing, like the sequencing, you extracting all this, you share the DNA, and it so happened that you got like all of these, I don't know, 30, 40 DNA molecules which are exactly the same and they come from that location, which would be okay. But more likely is that what happened is that uh, these things were uh, over amplified during PCR. So you had like one copy of like one read like this, which is one of these green things. And during the PCR amplification steps, we, uh, which are not, those are not uniform. So you, you can get some molecules being amplified much more than others. So in this case, this particular molecule, even though there was about as much sequence, this, this portion here occurred about the same amount in the donor genome, 
during during amplification you create this thing, when you map the back, you obtain these things, and it looks as if there are more copies of this region in the field. Okay, so this is what duplicates are. And there are two sources. Oh, on the on the right is an image where like you, it's it's more normal. So you still have some duplicates, maybe here, like some molecules which start on the same location. But this is a more uh, there's not such an abrupt uh, increase, right? So this is a more gradual increase. So maybe this this might be okay as opposed to this. so this might be a true signal, like maybe indeed this region occurs several times in the problem. But here it's probably not. Okay, so to, there are PCR duplicates. These are created during the PCR amplification. And there are also what's called optical duplicates, which are uh, the machine reading the same cluster, like the shining the lasers. Maybe it doesn't make the distinction between like, the, the location where the light comes from. Okay, this can lead to problems. And there is some software to remove them, which is the Guardian. We'll, we'll do that in the lab. Yeah. So, from, uh, so when the when the picture is taken on the slide, right, uh, like the individual clusters they shine one light, like a red or a blue, whatever. And it might be that the uh, image processing, which is done inside the sequencer, will somehow split that light into two spots. So it will produce two spots, even though, like in reality, there are just one. I think so, yeah. Yes, yes. So the, so the uh, there's some information about the location where these reads come from in the read the label, and the software uses that to infer that they're optical. Is that, uh, is that a big problem for the organization? So it could be a problem for it. I mean, do you observe often? How often do you observe the uh, optical? I think so it's, it's not, it, it, you have to be aware of that. So that, that's why it's a standard thing to run a duplicate removal or marking that. Even if you don't have PCR amplification, you still get these things to be. So the pink part can handle up those. Uh, yes, 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 you can handle them. Yeah. Um, the, so that's duplicates. The other thing I wanted to show is. Uh, in the alignment, so let's say you look at uh, some alignments and they look like this. So there's a base sequence here and these are reads with like some arrows. And if you just look at them, you, you might notice that, so all the reads which kind of end on this side, they show like a variation, a snip or two snips over here towards the end of this read. Okay, all the reads which and in this direction, on this side, they show a different two or three snips on, or like in here. Okay, so if you see a picture like that um, in a visualizer, that might be, that, that illustrates a problem with, uh, it might actually illustrate a problem with uh, in the alignment. So if you run some software, which is called a realigner, that thing might look at all these alignments and actually do this, like realign all the reads so that they do. So what happened here is that uh, we said at the beginning, Illumina data has split, uh, character, is characterized by uh, substitution errors. Okay, for that reason, the aligners are not uh, will not so easily introduce uh, indels. Right? If they see a read, it will. The aligner will try to somehow, like using mapping scores, and it will try to place the individual uh, bases, uh, force them somehow against the, against the genome, unless uh, they have like good evidence that there might be an indel over there. Okay? Uh, the problem is that the aligner always looks at only one read or one read pair at a time, so it always has to make this call looking at only one read. Okay, for that reason, um, indel alignment, which is also like a standard uh, step in this processing, uh, is a process which looks at all the reads mapped to a certain region together. 
Okay, and once once a, a in the realigner sees this kind of a picture, it might aggregate information from all the risks to say, well, yes, indeed, this just looks like all this mess, all these substitutions here, here are kind of better explained by just putting like one phase insertion on this. Here it's a deletion, this phase P is deleted. So that's what in the uh, alignment is all about. Um, this picture over here, it's kind of the same thing uh, forget the top part. So here you see, it's better to see it on your slide. In the middle of the uh, bottom slide, you will see a big a read map with like a, a big deletion. And it, apart from that, like these ends are, are exactly the same thing. So these are read ends which are being misplaced because the, the, uh, the aligner cannot, there is not sure that it should traverse the entire read. Okay, but the, an, an either realignment might be able to uh, aggregate this information and uh, remap the reads correctly. Is this the step that is coming in this alignment? Would it do it with the alignment? I just wonder if this read or something that's coming in this alignment is coming in this alignment. No, so it's a different software. So the, so the, uh, so you had another step. Yes, yes. So the aligners, the aligners can only look at one read or read pair. That, and that's why they don't do that. In the class, they have to do a lot of stuff. Afterwards, yeah, that's, that's a different step. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to mention before the lab is stuff about novel sequence. So going back to what was pointed out, the reference doesn't always contain uh, the same base, like the same regions uh, that the donor has. Right? So, here we are in a chromosome next to a centromere. Like this is the position where we're looking. And you can see this very wild variation in coverage. So you have here coverage, which is about a certain level. And then you have these peaks. And then it goes down. And then some, some more peaks. So what's happening here is that there are differences in the copy numbers of those repetitive regions between the donor and the reference. And an aligner will just try to place all the reads that you to try to place them somewhere in the reference. Okay? And for that reason, it might create kind of garbage alignments in, in such regions. Okay? Um, another thing which, I, so I posted a, a link on the wiki, like an external, like additional resource. Um, so a few years ago, 2011, Ken Lee decided that uh, there was too much contamination like in some, uh, human sequencing thing, so that he created a, a, a reference which contains decoys. So what that means is that you have a normal human reference, which is AG19, and in addition to that, like he added all sorts of like viruses and other common sources of contamination which are found in uh, sequencing experiments. Uh, and those are like, they appear as individual kind of chromosomes in that reference. And the moment you sequence and you get that kind of contamination, the aligner will just map those reads away from the chromosomes into this kind of decoy system so that you don't force them to be mapped onto the reference and create this kind of uh, uh, false positive mutation. Okay? So that's, uh, yeah. so that's what I wanted to say. Sources of her, so Sorts of errors are duplicate, and we have software to do with that. In the realignment, we can do, we can deal with that. And yeah, for for novel sequence, there isn't much to do. Uh, like if you if you really have novel sequence in a donor as opposed to a reference, which is not contamination, then you cannot get it with reference map because it just doesn't exist. Okay. Is that it? Uh, yes. Do you see the contamination? Uh, what kind of contamination do you know? Like, is there? Like, you have to hold the exposed viruses, which then 